Good morning, everyone, and welcome on this beautiful day. Feels like four. Uh, welcome to Skadafa Library and Chats with Champions. Chats has a 17-year history of presenting programs that span the interests of all segments of our community. It is sponsored by Sherman's Main Coast Bookshop. Today we are pleased to have as our speaker, noted photographer, Bob Hills, who will present an illustrated talk entitled, Iceland, It's a Big Country. Last September, Bob was here and he presented photos and commentary on Cuba and its people. And it was such a great talk, we asked him to come back when he visited this year. Today he will speak about Iceland, the Nordic island nation defined by its dramatic <coughs> landscape with volcanoes, geysers, hot springs, and lava fields. He will tell about the economy, history, weather, language, and flora and fauna. His photos show the massive glaciers that are protected in the national parks, as well as the city of Reykjavik, which runs on geothermal power and is home to the national and saga museums that trace island's Viking history. Originally from New Jersey, he moved to Northern California in the late 60s. He spent his career in various sales and marketing positions for companies that supplied manufacturing equipment to semiconductor device manufacturers domestically in Europe and in Asia. He has degrees in mechanical engineering and, engineering and metallurgy from Siemens Institute of Technology. It's my pleasure to introduce Bob Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, first thing I'd like to ask is how many people have been to Iceland? Oh my, okay. If I make any mistakes, please correct me. Uh, and I, I say that Iceland is a big country and for those of you that have been there, it is a big country. And I think that you, you, by looking at this picture, you can see just how big it is. This is a typical picture of Iceland with mountains and snow and beautiful clouds, a water feature here, a water feature there. And what you don't see in this picture over here is a city. So they have these magnificent mountains, lots of vistas, and cities all, and towns all over the place, but they don't stand out because the geography is so large. Where's Iceland? Well, it's between Greenland and uh, 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 Norway. Norway, thank you. <laughs> right there. And uh, to pick it up a little bit closer, uh, it's located in the North Atlantic. It's 170 miles from the Arctic Circle. It's 2,500 miles from Damariscotta. <laughs> and it's situated on the European plate which means it belongs to Europe. The place names are not pronounceable by outsiders. <laughs> and number one and number two are two of the largest national parks. The Icelandic language has 32 characters. And I didn't make any effort to learn the language or learn the pronunciation. It was beyond my pay grade. 1,787 miles from the North Pole. Portland, Maine is 3,200 miles from the North Pole. So Iceland is 1,433 miles north of Portland, or about the same distance as it is from Portland to Miami. So it's way up there. And the reason it doesn't freeze is because of the, uh, the uh, Gulf Stream. This is Iceland, of course. The red is known as the Ring Road, and it's where everybody goes on their tourist trips around Iceland. There isn't much in the inside of the island for people visiting. Um, I was asked, are there roads that take you to the interior of the island? The answer is yes. But once you get off the main road, the, the Ring Road, the uh, roads are pretty much gravel. And the problem with that is if you've rented a car, if you're going on a trip by yourself, and you get into the inland uh, off the main road and you break an axle or have a problem, you can't call AAA. There is no AAA in the middle of Iceland. Is that 
capital, as everybody knows, is Reykjavik. Population is 340,000, 350,000. The area is about the same size as New York State. Land of volcanoes, geysers, hot springs, lava fields, glaciers, rivers, and streams. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a caldera that we visited. This was off the beaten track. This was probably, I don't know, five miles and a two mile walk from the uh, Ring Road uh, to get into this particular site. But you can see the lava around it and these beautiful clouds. If you're a photographer or interested in that at all, uh, Iceland is the place to go and bring a camera. <coughs> geysers, there are geyser fields throughout Iceland. Uh, it's a geothermic, geothermic, it's a hot place. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, Reykjavik heats the entire city with steam from underneath. Uh, notice, uh, this, these pictures were taken in early, or, or, I'm sorry, in mid-May. And I'm going to speak about that later on in the talk, but look, look at the number of people here. Some of the mountains, some of the uh, glaciers. Waterfalls. The waterfalls are beautiful throughout Iceland. Um, for those of you that have been there, you've seen them. There are, there are narrow high ones, and there are big, wide, shallow ones, and places to take pictures after pictures after pictures. This uh, particular uh, waterfall was in somebody's backyard. I'm going to speak to that a little bit later, but uh, a lot of people had these in their backyard. <laughs> have these. It's almost like if you own a ranch and you don't have a beautiful uh, water feature like this in the backyard, you don't own a good ranch. A little bit about the economy. Uh, the annual GDP is 24 billion. The individual GDP is 68,000. And I compared that to Maine. Maine's GDP is almost twice as much at 52 billion, but the individual GDP is 39,000 or almost half as much. The principal industries are tourism, fishing, aluminum smelting, ferrosilicon production, which is used in the production of uh, steel, geothermic power, geothermal power, and hydropower. Uh, literacy rates 99%. It's history. 850 it was discovered by the Vikings. In 870, Reykjavik was settled by two families from Norway. Uh, after a period of time, one of the families, the uh, chief of the families, was dispatched by his slaves, which uh, I didn't realize, but uh, where, where these tribes or families went, they brought slaves with them to do the work. They established a policy, uh, parliament in 930 AD. And what caused this, all of these landowners and all of these chiefs were fighting and warring and rustling each other's cattle and sheep and all that stuff. And they said, wait a minute. And they formed this parliament. And the parliament set down the rules about who do what, did what to who and how. Iceland becomes Christian in the year 1000, and uh, the Catholic Church put a lot of missionaries into uh, to Iceland. Denmark took it over in uh, 1397 due to a marriage of the royal families. One of the things in the dowry was this island. They said, here, take this, take Iceland. Okay. <laughs> In 1550 AD, Ireland became Lutheran, and there was a, a fight between the Catholics and the Lutherans. Lutherans won. They dispatched the bishop, so there were no more Catholics. No more Catholic religion as such. Uh, in 1783, the Lucky Geiger erupts, uh, one of their volcanoes, and it killed one in three Icelanders. And it, they didn't die necessarily from the eruption, but they starved because the, uh, the uh, ash and whatnot killed all the animals, so there was nothing to eat. So a lot of these people just plain died, uh, starved. 
1944, they declared independence from Denmark. And the big event most recently was their financial meltdown. The country went broke. They couldn't pay their bills. And more than that, it was an emotional impact for the people in Iceland because they're very thrifty. They're very, uh, they watched their money and all of a sudden money was there, no more. So, so for about a 10 year period, Iceland was walking around with their shoulders slumped and their chins down. In 2018, the Iceland soccer team qualified for the FIFA World Cup, smallest nation to ever to apply, uh, to, uh, to qualify. And during the World Cup, one third of the population, roughly 110,000 people, went to see Iceland play in the World Cup. A third of the country went to see them play. And that brought them back up. We're, we're, we're good again. It was a tremendous, tremendous uplift for the people. Some bad, bad news. How many people went on WOW Airlines to one, two, three? OK. Uh, WOW Airlines had $99 airfares from the East Coast to, uh, to Iceland. And uh, when I went, I went with uh, four other people. And I kind of set the trip up. And they said, well, how are we going? And I said, we're going by WOW Airlines. Well, that was not too well accepted. But it turns out that WOW Airlines was a nice, clean airline, on time, big seats, nice people, good food, but they went broke. So, so much for nice people, big seats, clean airlines. Uh, so they went out of business in uh, for March 19th of this year. Um, there is some debate about where WOW Airlines and the class of people they brought to Iceland. Since they were a low cost airline, it was thought by the native Icelanders that they were bringing cheaper tourists. I'll leave that where it is. Okay, the temperature. In the summer, it's about in the mid 50s. You know, 60 degree day is a hot day. 65 degree day is unbelievable. Uh, it's about mid 40s as a low. Now, one of the things that you have to realize when you go to Iceland is the wind blows. And when it blows, it gets cold. We arrived mid-May, and we were in Reykjavik, and we were going north, and we went on a tour. We took a tour. Uh, and they, our guide says, hey, we can't leave yet. The wind is too high. Oh, okay, so drive through the wind. He said, no, 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 it's really too high. It's blowing uh, semis over, semi, uh, trucks over. Not sure. So anyway, we took off the next day, and sure enough, there were a couple trucks laying on, us on their side like dead elephants that had gotten blown over in the wind. And during our trip around the island, this guy was always monitoring the wind. It's something you don't think about. But there it was. The winter is 30s high and 20s low, which is probably warmer than them or Scotland. And again, it's, the temperature is moderated by the Gulf Stream. Sunlight, 16 to 22 hours a day. That's a lot of sunlight. And I'll talk to that in a minute. Winter is 4 to 10 hours a day, and that's a lot of darkness. Now, I looked at this uh, uh, four to 10 hours a day, and I thought, geez, you know, I wonder if these guys have, have problems. Do they drink? Do they do themselves in? The suicide rate in uh, Iceland is about 13.1 per 100,000. In the US, it's about 13.3 per 100,000. And in Maine, it's about 18.5 per 100,000. So they seem to be pretty happy. And I thought, well, maybe it's because they drink a lot. So I looked to see what their drinking rate was. And I forgot who did the rating, but there were 28 countries that they rated. And Iceland was fourth from the bottom. So I don't know what else they do. <laughs> there are no northern lights in summer. And the reason is because there's too much daylight. So don't go up there in the middle of the July looking for the northern lights because they probably won't be there. The official language is Icelandic. 
and as I say, I made no attempt to learn it or any of the rest of it. The English is taught in all schools starting in grade school, and English is common on the island. It says, this was a sign outside of a cafe, even puffins come for coffee. And speaking of puffins, Iceland has got somewhere between 5 million and 15 million puffins. They got puffins all over the place. And they have puffin rookeries that you can go to and observe the puffins. And what they've done in the rookery that we went to, they put a flight of stairs up into the rookery so that you can walk up the stairs and look and see what the puffins are doing, doing their puffin thing. Um, the puffins don't seem to, to, to bother the people. You know, they're right there. They're from, from me to you away. They'll be there looking at you, not paying any attention. Uh, they're not always there. Sometimes they're out in the lagoon fishing, doing their puffin thing. But generally, they come up. And uh, I only included one puffin picture because every gallery that I've been to in Maine has a series of puffin pictures that are better than anything I took. The only thing I can say is they're right there. You don't need a telephoto lens. You don't have to take a boat. You get out of the car, you walk up these stairs, and there's the puffins. Question came, do they eat puffins? The answer is yes, but uh, it's not common. I don't think we'll see a day when we'll see eggs with puffin or Puffin nuggets, puffin McNuggets. It's not that that kind of thing. And they, they do protect them. Birds of Iceland, puffins, Arctic tern, gear falcon, ravens, meadow pipit, white tailed sea eagles, eider ducks, ptarmigans, golden plovers, and harking ducks. This is an eider duck. I think that's what I was told. And this picture was taken about 10.30 at night, OK? And it was pouring rain. God, it was pouring rain. And we're out there trying to take pictures. And I got this one. I love the composition. I've tried everything in my software to make it a better picture. I've given it to other people to make a better picture. It can't be done. The, the, uh, the, the quality of the, the image is not there to do it. But it's a nice composition. Now, while we were here, <clears throat> the, the parking lot, of course, we went took pictures. Across the parking lot, there's uh, two fields, like side by side, uh, about the size of football fields. And Arctic, Arctic terns were doing their thing. And there were thousands of them. So I said to the guide, I'm going to go over and take pictures by the Arctic, Arctic terns. He said, no, I wouldn't do that. I said, well, why not? He said, well, when you go over there, they'll poop on you. Well, it's pouring down rain. I got my raincoat on. I said, oh, OK. A little turn poop is going to turn. And he says, if you get too close, they will attack. And this is, I've read this since, that Arctic terns get very defensive of their turf. And they will come down with their talons and dig into you. So no Arctic turn pictures. My, my, uh, my, uh, my apologies. One of the other things is, one of the people in our group had a drone, and he was doing drone photography. And he had his drone up there, and all of a sudden, one of these white tail eagles comes along and <laughs> go by drone. And he knocked the drone on, down on the side of this mountain. So this guy had to climb about 500 feet up to retrieve, retrieve his drone, which was knocked down by the eagle. So when you go, watch the birds. This uh, is the same location that was taken again about 11 o'clock at night. And this was after we'd eaten dinner. You know, everybody's ready to retire. And the guy says, oh, we must go take a picture of the sunset. Oh, great. So we went out, and this, is, uh, this was all taken at the same time. The animals of Iceland, the natives of the Arctic, foxes, the whales, the sail, seals, and the polar bears. But they don't have a lot of polar bears. Polar bears come over on drift ice once in a while. I think they check it out and go back home. Um, the important animals are the Icelandic horse, the Icelandic sheep, the Icelandic dog, and the Icelandic cow. 
I didn't see anything about Icelandic cats, so for you cat lovers, I don't know. They have reindeer and rabbits and mink. The Icelandic horse, it's a small horse, about five feet tall. And they're known to be sociable, uh, curious and intelligent. They handle the Arctic weather well. They have five gates. A few people that ride, you know more about this than I do, but I guess it's like having overdrive or some other gear <laughs> that makes them ride nice. The population's around 80,000. And 100,000, interestingly enough, live abroad. And they're used for farm work in addition to showing, racing, and recreation. And I saw a lot of Arctic horses, and I'm thinking, OK. I don't see any Arctic, uh, Icelandic uh, cowboys, and I didn't see any Icelandic saddles. I'm thinking, what's with these horses? And it turns out that uh, some of them are culled out of the herds for meat. So you can eat horse meat. The Icelandic sheep brought over uh, with first settlers from Norway. Population is about 800,000. The wool is sought after throughout the world, and the meat is a feature in most non-fish dishes in Iceland. Once an animal, a horse, a sheep, or cattle leaves the island, can never come back. And that's an issue of uh, uh, diseases. They don't want to bring any outside diseases back in, into the island. There's the Icelandic sheep. And these pictures were taken the second week to the third week in May, and see how green it was. Throw this one in, too. <coughs> Agricultures. I was thinking, gee, you know, what are they doing for agriculture? Uh, the, uh, they grow tomatoes, cucumbers, bell peppers, cabbage, etc., etc in greenhouses. Of course, they have uh, the thermal uh, springs to heat the greenhouses with, and they get a lot of sunlight. Spring comes fast to Iceland. Uh, they do do some farming of carrots, rhubarb, uh, cauliflower, etc. Uh, things that grow in cold weather. Everything else is imported. Some of the vistas. Now, one of the things I'm not going to cover here is the, <coughs> is the Blue Lagoon. For those of you that have been there and been in the Blue Lagoon, Lord love you. To me, I thought it was a tourist trap, and that's a personal opinion. If I've offended, none so be it. But uh, the charge is, I think, uh, 40 bucks to go in, and you have to make reservations two weeks in advance. And as a tourist, I I didn't want to do that, so I passed. No, no Blue Lagoon pictures. This is a picture I took, and it was, uh, they have a, uh, an area where they have sod, uh, sod houses, much as, the, as they did uh, uh, basically a thousand years ago there. And it's a village, and it shows you how the people lived back when. And this was in the back, and I took this picture because, again, of the clouds, the mountains, the beautiful greenery, okay, and this church. There's a picture, again, give you an idea about the water features and the size of the people, okay? This picture, again, was taken about 11.30 at night, and there's enough light at that hour to, to, to still do good photography. Now, some of my observations is go in the second week in May. It's just before the tourist season starts, and for those of you who have been in July, August, and September, Maybe you can remember the number of tourists that you ran across. I showed that picture before of the geyser with a few people standing around it. In the summer, it's 
ringed with people. And as a photographer, you say, geez, you know, do I really want all these pictures of my, uh, my image? You get 23 hours of daylight. Oh, the other thing is the prices are less. Their prices in the winter are low. Then they go up. Then they go up. And June, July, and August, they're up. And then they come down in September, and they go down in the winter again. So if you catch the second week in uh, uh, May, you get the beginning of spring. Everything is blooming. All these little uh, foals are coming out. And all the little uh, lambs are coming out. The weather's warming up. There you go. It goes from 45 to 50. Uh, the, the birds are nesting in full plumage. Uh, everything, every bird we saw was gorgeous. It looked like they'd been painted for the tourists. And maybe they were. Uh, I would suggest taking a tour. I know a lot of folks want to do it on their own. It looks pretty simple. You can just go around right the ring road. One of the advantages of taking a tour that we saw, we went to places that the tourists generally don't go in just going on the ring road. We got on some of the gravel roads off the ring road. And we did some walking, some long walking. Um, but to me, the, uh, with a tour guide, he knows more about it and can tell, he or she can tell you more about it than just going on your own. The other thing I would suggest is bring a camera, and not for selfies. Even if it's just a cell phone, take some pictures. It's gorgeous there. Uh, it's tough to make a bad picture. Spend time in Reykjavik. Reykjavik is a very walkable town, certainly a safe town. It has good uh, entertainment, has good restaurants. It has fine museums. I was only there two days, and I would say spend a minimum of three, maybe five, if you have the time. There's a lot to see in Reykjavik. Just some of the... Uh, the uh, images, some of the vistas. This is the black church. I'm sure you've all seen the black church that have been there. And this is the uh, go-to location for photographers because this black church, as shown here, kind of stands out in the field all by itself. And you can get it with mountains in the background. You get these beautiful cloud formations, sunsets, whatever. This area, this picture I included again because of the greenery. Here we are the second week in May and things are greening up like crazy. And you can see this, uh, the, the water around the, the field. Many fields have ditches around them. And I thought, well, what, what are these ditches for? And I asked, and as opposed to what we have in California, where we have these ditches to bring water in, these ditches are so they can bring the water out. It rains there a lot. And when it rains, of course, the fields get uh, a lot of water in them, so they have to be drained. And what they do is just drain through these uh, ditches out to the sea. I thought that was interesting. And finally, a sunset that we took, uh, and that was the, uh, the final one that we took uh, during our trip. So thank you. Any questions or comments? Do they have peat? And if they do, do they burn it? I don't think so. I didn't see. They don't need peat. If they want hot water, literally, they stick a, a pipe in the ground, hot water. The only reason they have to import oil at all is to run their buses and cars and trucks. Yes, sir? How would you characterize the people? They're nice. But we caught them at the beginning of the tourist season, too. <laughs> and I think there's something to be said. You know, they get tired. And, oh, God, more people. You know, welcome to my unpronounceable town. You know, and, and, uh, I think their attitude, like anybody, so this is not a slam on them, is better in May than it is in, in September. But everybody spoke English pretty much. Uh, we didn't run into any problems there. Yes, ma'am. No, I didn't see any solar plants. 
Again, they, they don't need it. They have such an abundance in this thermal power and hydropower. I mean, it's, you want, you want hot water? You got hot water. It's as simple as that. You, you asked about the people. One morning I got up early and was eating breakfast and this family owned the uh, hotel that we were in. And we had a little hotel and again, some unpronounceable town. And uh, I got talking to her and one of the th things I saw throughout Iceland, particularly in the northeast corner, was these cairns, uh, piles of rocks about this big, about that big around. And uh, I, I was talking to her, I said, what are, what are these cairns? And she said, oh, they're, they're my, my markers. I said, they're out in the middle of the field, what could that be? And it turns out her great-grandfather, who settled that area, uh, got a, a job, I'll call it a job, but he used to take people from one part of Iceland to another part of Iceland. And in order to do that in the winter, he set these cairns up so that he would know where he was going because there wasn't much light. And they had a guy go from place to place to place. So I thought that was really interesting. Here you are, you know, two or three generations later, and these rock piles are still out there. Uh, uh, you may have seen them on your trips, and uh, now you know what they were if you didn't before. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the coldest temperature in uh, May, in mid-May, uh, what's the coldest temperature in mid-May? What was the temperature like when you were there? 45, I would say. What did you say? About 40, 45. Okay. But that wasn't the problem. It was the wind. The wind. And how, how soon do you have to book for that kind of trip in May? We started mm, probably around Christmas. Yeah. Yes. How much time should you spend to see the ring road properly, or does it matter? Well, we were there uh, 12, 14 days. And uh, if you go with the tour, they're generally about that long. And uh, again, the rest of the time, I, I should have spent more time in Reykjavik. That's the only thing that I that I uh, regret about not having gone, uh, not having spent more time was in Reykjavik. Yes, sir? Did you book your flight separately from the tour? And yes, many, I did. How many people were on your tour, and did they take care of your lodging and all of that? Uh, we booked our flight. We flew on WOW Airlines. There were five of us from California, one from Germany, one from Austria, and one from India. The guy that lost his drone was from India. So there are eight of us. And uh, what was your second question? I'm sorry. Did, those were all the people on your tour? Did right. the tour handle all your lodging? Yes, lodging and food and all that stuff. So it was all inclusive. Uh, if you were going to drink, you had to buy your own booze. So that's, that's common. Um, but we had good food and good lodging on the whole, whole route. Oh, that's the question here. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll get Do they have traditional meals or, I mean, do they make horse meat, obviously? Yes, they do. Okay, so tell me a little bit about the food. I didn't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I stuck with fish. Okay. And pretty much that was it. I'm not as adventurous as some. I didn't, but they have all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Yes, sir. So this follows on that. What, what's your sense of the status of the fishery there? They, they are always fighting with somebody about fishing rights. Right. You know, I think the latest is they're fighting with England. Because England's <laughs> coming up and getting in it. What's that? They were doing that back in the 50s also. Yeah, this has been going on probably since the Vikings were banging on the Celts, you know, a thousand years ago. But they, they uh, do try and protect their own. They do, do try and expand their region when they can. We'll leave it at that. Yes, ma'am. One question about, um, do they have a winter industry of skiing for tourists and that sort of thing? Skiing? Skiing. I don't think so. Yes. There's Somebody said yes? There's one ski area. Oh. And it's on the, uh, on, uh, in the northeast. God, that must be cold. Well, at only 20 degrees, but the wind, the wind goes, 
Right through you. I, uh, of course, I'm a California guy, but I, the first, the first day we were out taking pictures of this waterfall, and I took a couple pictures of the waterfall. I said, "Okay, I'm done." Well, we had walked about a mile to get into take pictures of the waterfall. So I thought, "Well, what am I going to do now?" And I went back to the to the bus that we were traveling in, and the bus was locked. <laughs> and I stood there in the. Uh, leeward side of the wind, or uh, leeward side of the bus, and I froze. And I said, I'm not going to have a good time. But I did. It turned out I had a fine time. But dress warm. Yes, sir? I've got a question. I spent a, a year in Iceland, and I, good friends that we had, the, the, the husband was Larry, but Laris Olaf's son, and his wife was Gudni, Noah's daughter. Do they still kind of keep that? They do, except the young folks are choosing to get be known as Laura instead. I'm Laura, not Laura Charles' daughter or jo Johansson's daughter. I'm Laura. Uh, how much more they'll do, I don't know. But that's typical in Scandinavian countries too that they name uh, follow that tradition. Yes, sir. One of the things they do to tourists is. Uh, for fermented shark. Did you try that? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I was offered all kinds of that stuff. I couldn't read it. And when it said uh, fermented shark or something, no, thank you. I'm a, I'm a meat and potatoes guy. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> pretty strong. Uh, I did, uh, I should probably include this, but on one of our tours, we were up going somewhere. And in this little itty bitty town, we ate lunch, and I was wandering around out the back of this little bitty town, and they had racks and racks and racks of drying fish. Right, they stink. <laughs> What's that? They stink when the wind blows, right? Yeah, I didn't get downwind of those things. <laughs> so, anything else? Yes, sir? Any, any uh, issues or problems with active uh, earthquake volcano activity? You know, Not when we were there. Disturbing. But they got lots of volcanoes, and they got lots of geysers. And uh, we didn't experience any problem. That doesn't mean there isn't one. The one puffed up a couple of years ago, and everybody had to fly around Iceland because of the, uh, the cloud coming out of the volcano. Yes, sir? Um, we were there this summer, and you didn't, uh, I, I wanted to recommend if people go, the uh, West Westland Island or something like that. There's a ferry boat that goes out there. Uh, it has a great. Um, it has a place where they're rescuing uh, um, whales. What, what are orcas, they? aren't they? No, no. the uh, uh, belugas. The white belugas. Ah. The white ones. Uh, they're buying them up from. China, where they're used in shows and things like that, and trying to re introduce them to them. Mm. And then they also have a, a, a great museum about lava and volcanoes, and uh, uh, several others, just some excellent museums. The, yeah, there, there's 12 of them, and yeah. they, well, well, I, I went to two, Reykjavik, but, huh? just in Reykjavik, and yeah. they, they were great. Yeah. Well, that was that was a highlight of the trip. I only had two days to do it, and I thought, oh gosh. Anyway, I would recommend every. Hold on a sec. I recommend everybody go, even if you've been there before. Go again. Yes, sir. <laughs> Could you put the map back up on the screen? Uh, okay. Oops, gotta go the other way. Well, maybe not. Yeah, keep going. Well, it won't go any further. Oh, oh. <laughs> there you go. Where, where's the island that he was just referring to? Uh, yeah, best man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there you go. <laughs> best man islands, right down there. So, right up here. No, no down here. Right here? Right here? Way down. Right there. Ah, okay. Certainly it's the new island that was, it was this around 1970, the one that erupted in, a volcano erupted and created a new island. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's a relatively new island. Yeah. 
Well, that, yeah, that one is, that island you're talking about is out uh, a little bit further in the ocean. There's also a plane you could take up to, there's an island north of uh, Iceland, which is above the Arctic Circle. So if you want to get it above the Arctic Circle, you could take a flight up there. You mean Svalbard? Could be. Svalbard is owned by Norway. It's 1,500 miles north of that. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I didn't raise my hand when you said, uh, have you been to Iceland? Because I've only been to the airport, and I don't think that counts. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, what I was impressed with was the number of airplanes and the routes uh, that Icelandic Iceland Air has. Yeah. And yeah. it struck me that this must be a major enterprise uh, for Iceland. And I didn't see it listed there unless it was under tourism. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was on the flight back, uh, we touched, uh, flew over Greenland, just the tip of Greenland. Mm -hmm. And I was thrilled to be able to see Greenland before somebody decided to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I think buying Greenland is a good idea. <laughs> I think there's a lot there that uh, uh, we should get if we could. Sorry to feel that way, but I do. China's making inroads into uh, Greenland. And Greenland only has a population of 55,000 uh, 55, people. And they're all in the, in the uh, capital of Newark. Not Newark. N-U-U-K, Newark. Um, Greenland's cold. I mean, Iceland's like Florida compared to Greenland. Greenland is cold. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, since you were giving some travel tips, yeah, I didn't hear you mention that uh, if people, if, because Iceland, go, Iceland Air goes to so many destinations, they offer like a three-day stopover in Reykjavik on many of their flights, where like if you're going to Europe from the East Coast or something, uh, you can stop over three days and then return. Mm. Journey a trip, so it's a good way to quickly become uh, in introduced to, to this this country. They have some short tours uh, out of uh, Reykjavik too. That are yes. one mm -hmm. and two days. We did that three for days. One, one winter. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I know you went in May. Uh, what do you know about Northern Lights in winter, other than it's cold? They they have a they have a pretty good tourist business in the winter for people who want to come and see the Northern Lights, but you got to remember if it's cloudy you're not going to see them. But the the Northern Lights are very active in the winter, and of course you got 20 hours of darkness at uh, whatever it is, so you're going to see them. And they have ice caves, and they have other uh, attractions for the winter, including rotted shark or whatever. It is. <laughs> of course, you could always go to Norway. Uh, instead, I suppose. Yeah, even up to Canada. <laughs> yes, sir. I've got a question. When I was in Iceland, you know, they have the ice fields there. How, how much does that end up? Shrinking? Shrinking, yeah. I think they're more concerned with the, at this point, with the rate rather than the size. Uh, the, they seem to be shrinking a lot more now than they were 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Yeah. I think the same thing can be said of the Iceland uh, ice cap, uh, that, uh, the Greenland ice cap. And uh, they have a bunch of people up there now checking it out to see how fast it's going. Okay, I think that's it. Any further questions? Thank you all. Thank you all.